Okay, uh, chapter 12, section 1 is our first uh, section of Chem 1220, and it is about intermolecular forces. Okay, so intermolecular forces are the forces that occur between molecules, and I think the best way to see that is with figure 12.1. Uh, here we have two different methanol molecules or CH3OH molecules and the forces that hold the carbon atom to the hydrogen atoms and the oxygen atom those are covalent bonds those are intramolecular forces those are strong bonds that take a lot of energy to break um, and breaking them leads to a chemical reaction but between the two individual methanol molecules, there is a weaker attractive force that we call an intermolecular force. Uh, it's uh, strong enough to have uh, an important effect on the physical properties of the substance, but uh, it's weak enough that it, they're broken regularly. In fact, methanol uh, is a volatile liquid, it, and if it flows and if it uh, evaporates, then that involves the breaking of those intermolecular forces. Um, a weaker intermolecular force is going to lead to a lower boiling point um, and a lower melting point. So the things that um, are gases at room temperature, things like nitrogen and oxygen, here let me get rid of this, uh, nitrogen and oxygen for example have very very weak intermolecular forces. And so we're going to draw a, a diagram here. Okay, and these are weak intermolecular forces on the, left, on the bottom and strong intermolecular forces at the top. And the weak ones uh, are things that are gases at room temperature. Intermediate ones would be liquids at room temperature and uh, strong ones would be solids at room temperature. So stronger intermolecular forces have high melting points and high boiling points. Um, and uh, there are different types of intermolecular forces. We're going to need to um, build up an understanding so that if you look at the Lewis structure of a molecule, you can identify what types of intermolecular forces are at play. Um, the, um, we're we're going to not necessarily go through them in order of strength, but just in the order that they're presented in your textbook. And that starts with uh, some pretty strong forces here called ion dipole forces. So let me get the um, slideshow up here again. Uh, if you look at a uh, ionic compound, it's composed of cations positively charged and anions negatively charged. And the attraction between those ions isn't an intermolecular force, that's an ionic bond. Um, but when an ionic compound is dissolved in water, something like table salt in water, then um, those very strong ionic bonds are broken and replaced by ion dipole attractions with the water molecules. So water molecules are polarized, they have a positive end and a negative end. And you can see how the cation will be surrounded by water molecules that have oriented themselves so that the negative side is pointing toward the cation. And in fact, what's shown here is four water molecules, but in reality, a cation will be surrounded by multiple shells of water molecules that have oriented themselves in this way. So there could be a, you know, as many as 60 or so water molecules that have some um, uh, non-zero attraction to that cation. Uh, and likewise, the anion will be surrounded by shells of water molecules who have oriented their positive sides toward that ion. Um, and so um, the abundant number of ion dipole attractive interactions that can be formed by a uh, salt in solution uh, is able to overwhelm the strength of the individual ionic bonds and uh, and take the ions, uh, surround them with a lot of water, 
And that's what makes uh, solvation or the dissolving of a salt energetically favorable because of uh, all of these ion dipole interactions. Um, so next we have, sorry, they're pretty strong there up there near the top. Um, and they're maybe unique because uh, they specifically are talking about the solvation of salts. Okay, dipole dipole interactions. Actually, let's put them a bit lower down. Dipole dipole interactions are really simple to understand. Um, any polar molecule has a positive side and a negative side, and opposites attract. And so the uh, molecules, when they approach one another, the positive side of one will um, uh, match the negative side of the other and, and they will have some attractive force between them. And again, we've got a figure to make this clear. A uh, hydrochloric acid molecule, uh, the chlorine is much more uh, electronegative than the hydrogen. And if they're oriented perpendicular like we see at the top, then there's no net attraction. You know, the hydrogen is attracted to the chlorine, but the chlorines are mutually repulsive. But if the hydrochloric acid molecules orient themselves properly, then, um, then there will be an attractive force, and that is called a dipole-dipole uh, intermolecular force. Okay, so the next one is um, a lot more complicated, and this is called a hydrogen bond. And you can think of a hydrogen bond as uh, being a special case of a dipole-dipole bond. It's a particularly strong dipole-dipole bond. But I think that really doesn't quite capture the essence of hydrogen bonding. Um, we like to include it as a completely separate intermolecular force. And I want to make um, uh, a very important distinction here. Hydrogen bonds in this context are not just the covalent bonds that are made by hydrogen atoms to other hydrogen atoms. For example, here's a methane molecule, CH4, and here we have four hydrogens bonded to the carbon. Well, there are no hydrogen bonds of this type uh, in the methane molecule. So we need to talk about um, what a hydrogen bond intermolecular force really is and how to recognize when they are present. So um, in uh, certain compounds like water, you have uh, highly polarized bonds with hydrogen. Oxygen is much more electronegative than the hydrogen, so this bond is very polarized. And what that means is that um, the two electrons that make up this covalent bond are shared unequally. The oxygen takes more than its fair share of electrons, and the hydrogen is left bereft of, of electrons because of the electronegativity difference. Well, if that difference is great enough, then we can think of the hydrogen as having really no electrons at all. It's almost completely transferred its electrons over to the oxygen. Uh, they're uh, leaving this hydrogen uh, as an exposed positive charge. And if I have another water molecule nearby, uh, then uh, the lone pair located here on the oxygen is going to be able to form what's almost a full-blown covalent bond with that um, uh, hydrogen right there. We can think of this molecule on the left as a um, uh, hydrogen bond uh, hydrogen donor and this molecule on the right we'll call a hydrogen bond electron donor. 
And if you have both of those components in a molecule, then it's capable of engaging in hydrogen bonds. If it has uh, a hydrogen that has been uh, bonded to a highly electronegative atom, and therefore been stripped of its electrons, and if you have a free lone pair that is attached to a highly electronegative atom, then that could be an electron donor. So the question is, how electronegative does the other atom need to be? And uh, in this case, hydrogen, oxygen, hydrogen, nitrogen, and hydrogen fluorine bonds are really the only three bonds that um, uh, can participate in hydrogen bonding. So hydrogens that are bound to oxygen, nitrogen, or fluorine are able to participate in hydrogen bonding. And then these lone pairs also can't be on just any um, atom. They need to be also located on a um, sufficiently electronegative atom. So that would be a lone pair on an oxygen, a lone pair on a nitrogen, or a lone pair on a fluorine. Again, oxygen, nitrogen, and fluorine are the three elements that are electronegative enough to make hydrogen bonding a possibility. So here we've got um, hydrofluoric acid, HF, participating in a hydrogen bond. You see on the left um, the lone pair on the fluorine that's able to uh, donate electrons. Um, and then the HF on the right, that hydrogen is able to be donated into this hydrogen bond and you have a hydrogen bond between the two hydrofluoric acid molecules. Here's a couple more examples. Uh, water on the left, like we've already drawn, and then ammonia, NH3, also has um, all of the components necessary for hydrogen bonding. Um, if we look at uh, the water molecule, uh, those hydrogen bonds are highly directional. The uh, water needs to orient itself relative to its hydrogen bonding partner so that the lone pair and the hydrogen atom are pointing directly toward each other. And one of the really important consequences of this is that when water freezes to form ice, it uh, maintains that uh, structure. Uh, the orientation and direction of the molecules just kind of freezes in place. And that makes uh, water, uh, solid water or ice, have this very open, regular, crystalline structure. It has the shape it does because that is the shape formed by the hydrogen bonds. And uh, most substances, when they freeze, they won't look as ordered and they will not have as much empty space but water does because of this hydrogen bonding and it's hugely consequential if you think about how ice floats well that's not just convenient for um, uh, for cooling down our carbonated beverages or whatever but uh, the fact that ice floats is what allows um, marine life to survive through the winter in lakes that will freeze over on the top instead of um, freezing starting from the bottom um, and uh, uh, and obviously that, that's extremely important to our ecosystem that, uh, that life is able to persist through the winter and not, not freeze. If, if water ice were more dense than liquid water like most substances, then when winter came the, the lake would freeze all the way through and kill all of the fish. But um, because ice floats, then you'll get a thin, relatively thin layer of ice on the top of the lake that will insulate the rest of it. So anyway, it's just um, uh, a, a kind of, it's not completely unique, but a bit of an unusual property of water that is also extremely consequential as far as our ecosystems. Okay, and then here's another uh, important uh, application of hydrogen bonding. We'll talk about DNA at the very end of the semester um, when we're talking about biochemistry, but you're probably familiar at least with the basic idea of DNA that you have two different strands that have these components that are complementary to each other that 
they um, are attracted to each other uh, in, a, in a lock and key type mechanism so that uh, C is paired with G and A is paired with T. Again, we'll talk about the details of this later, but I just want to point out that DNA is held together by hydrogen bonds. The, uh, the base pairs, the C and the G, and the A and the T, they don't form covalent bonds with each other, they are hydrogen bonds. Okay, one second. So hydrogen bonds are um, really important, and I want to do some practice examples. So let's go back to um, our methane molecule. There are plenty of hydrogens contained in this molecule, but it is not capable of hydrogen bonding because those hydrogens are not bound to an oxygen, nitrogen, or a fluorine. These carbon-hydrogen bonds are actually pretty nonpolar, and so the electrons are shared equally, and these hydrogens are not exposed to form new hydrogen bonds. Instead, they have electrons surrounding them, and, um, and they're uh, just stable how they are. Let's look at another example. Okay, so this is the ammonium ion, and so being an ion makes it a little bit of a different example here. Uh, for example, it can certainly engage in ion-dipole interactions, but can it engage in hydrogen bonds? Well, here we have the hydrogen um, uh, bound to a nitrogen, that nitrogen is sufficiently electronegative that it's going to pull electrons away from the hydrogen. But we're missing the other component. We cannot have um, uh, a hydrogen bond without the lone pair located on a nitrogen, oxygen, or fluorine to complete the second half. Let's look at another example. This is a formaldehyde molecule, and we see that we have hydrogens in this molecule, but they are again bound to a carbon, so they cannot participate in hydrogen bonding. We've got a lone pair located on an oxygen, so we now have the other half of the hydrogen bond equation, but without a hydrogen to donate, then uh, this cannot participate in hydrogen bonding. Okay, let's look at one final one. Okay, this is the formic acid molecule, or uh, CHOOH, um, and uh, we see here a hydrogen bound to an oxygen and a lone pair that is located on an oxygen. And in fact, we've got lone pairs on oxygens in multiple locations. So this one may participate in hydrogen bonding. Uh, so formic acid molecules will have these particularly strong hydrogen bonding interactions with each other. Um, can I go back to water real quick? Sorry, I forgot to mention one last thing with my water diagram. So here we have a hydrogen bond between two neighboring water molecules. And I really want to emphasize that hydrogen bonds are they're like 80% of the way toward being a true covalent bond. And uh, this is really manifest in water because we can see how quickly ions can move through water. It's called an ion mobility and we can measure how quickly hydrogens will travel through water in electrochemical reactions. 
And what we find is that uh, hydrogens in particular are able to travel through water about 10 times faster than other ions. And the reason is because the hydrogens don't actually travel in the same way. Um, instead of one single hydrogen atom moving through the water all on its own, what will happen is that uh, this hydrogen bond will become a full-blown, uh, complete covalent bond, and the hydrogen will break its bond right there. And then this hydrogen will bond with its neighbor and break the bond right there, and so on and so forth. And um, you get, uh, instead of a single hydrogen migrating through the solution, instead you get kind of um, this uh, passing of uh, bonding interactions without a hydrogen physically moving its location at all. And the end result is that somewhere over here you'll have an extra hydrogen and that counts as a hydrogen having moved through the solution. Okay. So the last uh, intermolecular force that we need to talk about are dispersion forces. So um, dispersion forces occur in molecules that have no net dipole, so nonpolar molecules. And you can see how um, an isolated atom is surrounded by a cloud of electrons. And those electrons are in constant random motion and they, they have the, um, the shapes that are a little bit familiar to you from chemistry 1210, the p orbitals and the s orbitals and the d orbitals. But um, on average, it looks basically like a spherical cloud of electrons surrounding a nucleus. And that's what an atom looks like. Well, if any two atoms get close to each other and encounter one another, uh, their electrons are not always going to be perfectly distributed symmetrically around the atom. Because they are in motion, from moment to moment, the electrons might be on the left side, or on the right side, on the top, or on the bottom. And so even a nonpolar uh, molecule, or even a lone atom, is actually going to have these momentary dipoles. They're transient, and they disappear, and they change on an extremely fast time scale. But they do exist, and they are non-zero. And so when two neighboring atoms come together, then um, these small distortions in their electric uh, uh, in their electron clouds w may create um, attractive interactions between these momentary dipoles, just like a dipole-dipole interaction, but on a much smaller scale, both in terms of the strength and in terms of um, uh, time, because these interactions are just momentary. So these are called dispersion forces. And um, dispersion forces are generally very weak, but there are actually a lot of factors that can play into um, uh, how strong dispersion forces are. So, um, let's talk about the different factors. So there are basically three. So the first factor is the atom size. Um, small atoms like a hydrogen or a helium, um, uh, or, or even the second row elements like nitrogen, oxygen, and fluorine, uh, they have relatively few electrons. They have one or two shells of electrons, and the electrons are all held closely and tightly by the nucleus. And that means that uh, these distortions, which lead to dispersion forces, are relatively small. Um, it's uh, not easy for them to form these momentary dipoles. And so they have what is called a low polarizability. And polarizability is uh, how easy it is to distort the electric 
field around an atom, or in other words, to slosh its electrons back and forth, change their shape, and distort the shape of the electron cloud. So small atoms have a low polarizability, and they have weaker um, um, intermolecular interactions. Larger uh, atoms have a lot of electrons. They have many shells of electrons. And uh, that means that the outermost electrons, they're highly shielded from the nucleus. The uh, Z effective charge is not as great for them as the core electrons, and uh, they're a lot more polarizable. And so the effect of this can actually be quite dramatic. Remember I said that uh, uh, the lowest intermolecular forces are gases, the next up are liquids, and then the strongest ones are solids. Well, we can look at the periodic table, and uh, we can see this play out in the uh, halogens. So the halogens are all nonpolar molecules. You have F2, and it is a gas. It has the weakest intermolecular forces among the halogens because it has the smallest atom. And then you have Cl2, and chlorine is also a gas. Uh, it's a larger molecule. Uh, it's got larger atoms in it, and so it's a little bit more polarizable, but it is still a gas. And then you have Br2. Bromine is a much larger atom than chlorine, and bromine is actually a liquid at room temperature. And then finally, I2, iodine, still a nonpolar molecule, does not exhibit any of these types of intermolecular forces, only dispersion forces. But because iodine is such a big atom with so many layers of electrons and such a high polarizability, iodine is actually a solid. Here, I'll make this clear. Solid, liquid, gas, and gas. And so the uh, halogens really illustrate this principle very well, that larger atoms have higher polarizability and stronger intermolecular forces perhaps even strong enough to, to make it a solid dispersion forces for large atoms really belong up here in the strong intermolecular forces category. Um, so the next is molecule size. And for that, we're going to go back to the, the textbook figures. So here we have uh, different uh, alkanes or hydrocarbons. These are molecules that contain only carbon and hydrogen. So all of these uh, bonds are nonpolar. The molecules themselves are nonpolar overall. And they contain the same types of atoms. There aren't any big atoms like iodine here. They're all little, carbon and hydrogen. And if you look at their boiling points, as a function of the number of carbons, the larger the molecule is, the higher the boiling point can be. And it spans hundreds of uh, degrees Celsius. So you see um, methane there has a boiling point um, down like 100 Kelvin. That's extremely cold. Uh, and then you get up to uh, something like decane, drawn at the top, uh, C10H22, and the boiling point is almost 500. Uh, and so you see that um, the uh, overall size of the molecule can also have a huge effect on the strength of these dispersion forces. You can think of it as um, uh, just that uh, the dispersion forces happen on the atomic scale, and so the more atoms you have, the more dispersion forces are able to add up. So the decane, for example, has got 32 atoms, and so it's going to have like 32 times greater um, intermolecular forces than something like a helium atom would have. Um, another way to think about it uh, that's going to tie into our next question uh, is uh, surface area. So if the intermolecular forces are weak, but a large molecule presents a large surface area, then again the, the weakness of that attraction can add up over the great size of the surface area and uh, eventually give um, you know, impressively high boiling points like decane there at 447 Kelvin.
And then lastly, we have uh, shape. So, um, <clears throat> here we have two different uh, molecules of pentane. The ones on the left uh, have all of the carbons arranged in a straight chain. Um, and it has a boiling point of 36 degrees Celsius. The one on the right has like one carbon in the center and then the four carbons arranged around it. Uh, and they've got the exact same molecular formula and so they have the exact same uh, composition and molar mass. But the boiling point for the one on the right, the 2,2-dimethylpropane, sometimes called neopentane, its boiling point is 16 degrees Celsius lower, and it has a lower density as well. Um, and we can understand this because of the surface area presented uh, to neighboring molecules in both cases. So I like to uh, think of it like Velcro. And let me, okay, here so you can see my face. Okay, so uh, you probably played with uh, one of those uh, Velcro tennis ball mitt things where you put like a, you put the, um, uh, the hook side of the Velcro is plastered onto some plastic mitt that you put on your hand. And then the tennis ball is supposed to stick to it. And it, and it works all right. But uh, a tennis ball, because it is round, it's going to only contact the mitt uh, on, with a very small surface area. And so, uh, in my experience at least, uh, those things wear out quickly and they don't stick as well after very long. Even though Velcro is a, a good strong way to attach two things together, it just doesn't work very well when there's such a small surface area. Another way to think about it, uh, this is something that you've probably seen if you haven't done it yourself, but sometimes there are places where there's like a big trampoline and then a big Velcro wall and you can wear a Velcro suit, okay? And so you'll jump on the trampoline and then you'll jump up against the wall and you can stick to the wall, uh, which is pretty impressive. Like you're a, a human being with all of your weight and uh, the Velcro is able to hold your whole body weight up against the pull of gravity. Well, you can probably imagine if you had a Velcro suit um, and you splay yourself out, then you're gonna hit that wall with a lot of surface area, and that's what's gonna stick you. If instead, you just had that Velcro mitt on your hand, and you try to like stick to the wall with just your hand, it's not gonna hold, your body weight is gonna be too great and it will pull you down. Anyway, these are two kind of analogies for how the shape of a molecule can affect the strength of its intermolecular forces. Uh, the more surface area presented, then the higher the boiling point and melting point, the stronger the intermolecular forces. And as a proxy for surface area, uh, we can just think of it in terms of branchedness. So that's a bit of a funny word, but it's the best word here. Uh, the alkane on the left, the um, pentane, where they're all in a straight line, has no branches coming off of it. It's a straight chain, so it has a high surface area. The one on the right, it has got like branches going every which way. And so it has a high branchedness and uh, that gives it a uh, lower surface area for its mass. And uh, a lower strength of intermolecular forces, lower boiling point and melting point. Okay, that's it for 12.1.